What on earth is an anti-narcissist? It is someone who tortures a narcissist slowly, meticulously, and with ever-increasing sadistic pleasure. <laughs> nope, that's not an anti-narcissist. That's actually a typical self-styled expert on YouTube. You know, those who plagiarize my work shamelessly and repeatedly. <laughs> Today we're going to discuss this obscure topic in the study of narcissism anti-narcissism. It's not the first video I've made about this topic. There's a link to another video I've made about the connection between anti-narcissism and masochism, something I will discuss in this video as well. But today I would like to give you a tour of how did the concept of anti-narcissism come about? What need, what need, what problem did he try to solve? in the study of narcissism. My name is Sam Vaknin. I am a professor of clinical psychology and the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, the first book ever about narcissistic abuse back in the days of the dinosaurs in the 1990s. <laughs> okay, Kapsonim and Kapsonot, Shvanpanim and Shvanpanot, Shoshanim and Shoshanot, babies and bebets anti-narcissism. The concept of anti-narcissism was first proposed as such by Francis Pasch, P-A-S-C-H-E, P-A-S-C-H-E. That was in the 1960s. At the time, there was a raging philosophical and theoretical debate in psychology. People asked the question, what is narcissism? How should we define it? Do we even need to have it? Does it have any explanatory power? Does it add to our understanding of the human mind and of mental pathology and mental illness? What's the role of narcissism in psychic development? Questions that seem to have been settled decades ago re-erupted with full force mainly, I think, because of the emergence of the object relation schools, especially in the United Kingdom. I'm referring to people like Gantry and like Winnicott and Fairbairn and others. The concept of narcissism raised difficulties, complexities, aporias, internal inherent contradictions. And there was an attempt to resolve these issues. And People divided, psychologists divided to three camps. The first camp said, there's no such thing as primary narcissism. There's no such thing as narcissism, actually. There's only object relations. Object means people or a self. So there's only object relations. Initially, there's a relationship with the object inside, with oneself as an object. That's initially, that's in early childhood, in infancy. And then as we mature, as we grow up, those of us who do, <laughs> we begin to develop object relations, not with an internal object, not with our self, but we begin to develop object relations with external objects. In other words, with other people. There's no need. In this model, in this theory, there's actually no need for narcissism. Self-object or relationships with the self, um, they could be described as narcissism, but the emphasis is more about ob the object rather than the energy. Narcissism is an energy, according to Freud and Jung and others. It's an energy. It's a kind of redirected libido, a life force. And in the object relation schools, there was no need for that. There were just objects and the way we interact with objects. The object could be internal when we are children and becomes external. We interact with external objects when we discover the joys of sex and intimacy. <laughs> and so this was the first answer. They abandoned, these people abandoned the notion of primary narcissism and they gave a fundamental role to primary object relations. I'm talking about people 
that I mentioned before, but also Michael Balin and even John Bowlby of the Attachment School, the founder of the Attachment School. And then there was a second camp represented by the likes of Fedon, Paul Fedon and Bela Grunberger and others. And these people said that, yes, there is such a thing as narcissism, but it's not an energy. Or if it is an energy, it's not part of the life force. It's not part of what Freud used to call the libido. It's something completely different. It is another type of energy, and it is as ubiquitous, as all-pervasive, as powerful, and as motivating in mental life as is the libido. So they created a system with multiple streams of energy. One of them is the libido, the life force. One of them is narcissism. It was an interesting duality or dualism. And then there was the third school, most prominently represented by uh, Francis Pasch. And he also believed in duality or in dualism, whereas Grunberger and Ferdinand and others suggested that there's libido and there's narcissism and they're unrelated. Definitely narcissism is not part of libido. Pasch said, it's true, there is a duality, there is a dialectic even, there is a kind of dialogue between the, the forces, between the energies, but it's all encompassed and incorporated in the very concept of narcissism. In 1964 and 1965, he uh, elaborated on these ideas. He said that there's narcissism and there's anti-narcissism. He said that both forces, both, both energies, were defined by the object of the energy and the direction of the energy. He said the object was the same. The object, in his work, was the ego. Both narcissism and anti-narcissism in Pasha's work are directed at the ego. The ego is the recipient of these energies, similar to a large extent to Freud's libido. Uh, the direction, however, is not the same, is very different. Narcissism is inwardly directed. Narcissism aspires to the ego, aspires to be subsumed by the ego or to modify the ego or to interact with the ego somehow. It is centripetal, while anti-narcissism aspires away from the ego outward looking, it's public facing, and it's therefore centrifugal. Before I proceed, just to make clear, in my work and in the work of many others, very prominent ones, much more prominent than Pash, we believe that narcissists, people with narcissistic personality disorder or a narcissistic pathology of the self, actually don't have an ego. They don't have an ego. Pathological narcissism is the outcome of a disruption, severe disruption, in the formation of the, of the ego in infancy and early childhood. It is a perturbance uh, to the formation of the self. The self is unable to be constellated and integrated and become a unitary core identity. That's, that's the current belief, I would say. Today, that's the way we regard narcissism. But to Pasha's credit, uh, and, in, and in his defense, he was not talking about pathological narcissism. He was talking about healthy narcissism, or actually all forms of narcissism. He did not confine himself, himself to the narcissistic pathology, where there is an absence of self and an absence of ego. He was talking about narcissism as the equivalent of the libido, equivalent of a life force. So narcissism in Pasha's work is always there. It could go wrong, it could go right, it could become malignant, of course, it could become pathologic, pathologized, but all people have narcissism and all people have anti-narcissism. Narcissism aspires inwards with, its, with the ego as its object. Anti-narcissism aspires outward, but it aspires outward also with the ego as its motivator, as its interlocutor, shall we say. The ego is always there in Pasha's work, 
It's just that it generates two currents, like ACDC. It generates two currents, one going outward and one going inward. Anti anti narcissism, therefore, is an investment, a form of cathexis, a form of investment of psychic energy, but investment outside, investment to the world out there. It is therefore centrifugal. Um, it it kind of uh, rolls or revolves away from the ego. It's like like a body in the universe um, who spins, which spins out of the control of the field of gravity. So, in anti narcissism, the subject, the person tends to be divested of the self. In other words, in anti-narcissism, there is a lot more emotional investment or psychic investment, and a lot more emphasis on other people, on the outside world, on externality and separateness, on othering people. There's a lot more emphasis on objects, external objects, than on the internal object than on the self. It's as if in anti-narcissism we wish to forgo the self, forget the self, deny the self, repress the self, put the self away and focus on the environment, on the world around us. Give this world and endow it with our own uh, substance and reserves of emotion, emotional reserves such as love. And this is done altruistically. There's no evolutionary or utilitarian calculus here. It's done because the world is out there and the interaction with the world out there is compelled, it's kind of compulsive, is impelled by the very existence of the ego. Because you remember that the ego is reality oriented. It's the interface with the ego. So according to Pasha, actually, there are two dynamics. The ego is like a huge magnet, and this huge magnet attracts energy and investment to itself. Psychic life force is sucked into the ego. It's this gigantic magnet. And this is classic narcissism. At the same time, exactly as magnets do, the ego repels projects, sends away some of the energy. And this is anti-narcissism. And this energy that is catapulted from the ego, that is thrown off, that is rejected and expelled from the ego, this energy is invested in other people or in the world at large or in the environment. And it involves emotions, it involves emotions. It's not selfish. It's charitable. It's altruistic because it's not in relation with the self or with the ego. It's all about the world. And all the emotional investments investment goes out there. And this is the essence of love, for example. Anti-narcissism, um, in this sense, could be perceived as highly positive. Ironically, in Pasha's work, there is an immense paradox. Pash says, listen, there's the ego and there is emotional investment in the ego and that is centripetal. So it's drawn inwards and it represents the life force. Because when you love yourself, when you're invested in yourself, when your ego is the only object, when you're self-centered, where that, that, that's your life. You're, you're invested in your own life. So that is the libido. Ironically, when you're invested in other people, when you deny yourself, when you ignore your ego, when you are charitable and altruistic, that's not a manifestation of the life force. That's a manifestation of Thanatos, the death force, at least in Pasha's work. Because anti-narcissism involves unbinding. There is a destruction or a disruption 
to the attachment to the self. There's a separation. There's a dispersion of energy. It's not aggressive, but it's still dissipative. There's dissipation and dissolution and radiation outward. And so you cease to exist. Anti-narcissism means the disappearance of the core, the disappearance of the self, the denial of the ego, and the total emphasis on the outside world by vanishing. So it's a representation of the death force. It's very reminiscent of psychosis, by the way. At the same time, classic narcissism, which we associate with negativity and destruction and horrible things and self-styled experts and what have you, classic narcissism is actually, in Pasha's work, um, an exemplification, a manif manifestation, an expression and a reification of libido, of the life force. It's a paradox. It's counterintuitive, but it's an interesting point of view. Shando Ferenczi uh, wrote about the altruistic drive. And Shando Ferenczi said very much the same things about 20 years prior to, to Pash. He said the altruistic drive is actually self-dissipating, self-destructive. So there's a precedent to what Pash is saying. And then there's, of course, the inimitable French psychoanalyst André Green. André Green uh, wrote about narcissism and he came up with the, with the idea of negative narcissism. It's not exactly Pasha's anti-narcissism, but it's still an interesting departure. So I'll review now some of these ideas and then I will discuss my work on anti-narcissism. How I suggest to reconcile all these in, inherent internal contradictions and oxymorons in the work of Pash and Green and, and others. Anti-narcissism is a form of narcissism, it's a narcissistic character actually, that is not invested in self-aggrandizing -aggrand fantasy. In other words, it's not cognitively distorted. It's not about reframing reality to support a fantastic, ideal, perfect self-image and self-perception. That's classical narcissism. Anti-narcissism is not about it's not about a grandiose fantasy. It's about the outside, as I said. It diminishes the amount of self-investment and enhances the amount of other investment, investment in the other, or world investment, investment in the world, in reality. And so Francis Pasch in 1964 um, said that this centrifugal investment, this throwing away energy in a kind of centrifugal motion, this divestment of the self, this giving up on substance and reserves of love and redeploying them or reutilizing, reutilizing them to the outside, this is what we call altruism and charitability or charity. And Ferenczi preceded Pash in this sense with his altruistic drive. Andre Green wrote about anti-narcissism as negative narcissism. He said that negative narcissism is self-destructive. He agreed with Pash. Pash said that anti-narcissism, altruism, being charitable, negative, uh, and in Andre Green's words, negative narcissism, it's self-destructive because it seeks to abolish the ego or to ignore it, or to deny it, or to repress it. It is the aspiration for nothingness, which is where my notion of nothingness comes from. Nothingness, I have a channel, YouTube channel, titled Nothingness, Antidote to Narcissism. Nothing, nothingness is anti-narcissism, and I don't regard it as self-destructive. I regard it as self-negating. I regard it as an act of self-disappearance, or self-vanishing when the self is pathologized, when the self is not constellated, when the self is not integrated, when the self is a hindrance and an obstacle, like in the early childhood formation of narcissists. So, 
I agree with Andre Green that negative Gnosticism is self-destructive, but I think the destruction of the self, the unintegrated self, the non-constellated self, the self-contradictory self, the schizoid empty self of the narcissist, the destruction of this kind of immature self is actually a blessing. It is self-destruction, but this kind of self is best destroyed if you seek healing as a narcissist. And the alternative is negative narcissism or nothingness. Dual narcissism uh, was mapped by Andre Green and Pash. They mapped it into the other type of duality or dualism in psychoanalysis between life and death. They said the narcissism, anti-narcissism, life, death. They saw similarities. They saw equivalence. They mapped the drives. They said narcissism is the life drive or the life force is libido and anti-narcissism is the death force thanatos the strudo so they in a way grappled with the issue of positive narcissism this positive narcissism implies some kind of unity some kind of settlement some kind of equilibrium and homeostasis which are conducive to maturity and growth and healing they had a problem with that they had a problem with it um, because they said that that positive narcissism what we call healthy narcissism is only always comes in a pair with negative narcissism so there's no such thing as only positive narcissism there's always positive narcissism and negative narcissism and negative narcissism strives to annihilate the individual to zero level, to nothingness. And so this was Andre Green's uh, view. And whereas I'm a great admirer of Andre Green's work, especially his work on the dead mother, I vehemently disagree with him when it comes to negative narcissism, anti-narcissism, as I think it's a therapeutic tool, actually. And in this sense, I'm much closer to the ideas of Christopher Bolas. B-O-L-L-A-S. Not bollocks, but bolas. <laughs> bolas also have, has dealt... Well, bolas is famous for his unthought, uh, unknown, unthought, unknown thought. Uh, un, un, unknown thought, or, uh, which I discussed in, in previous videos. But another contribution is made, except the unthought known. Um, it's unthought known, I'm sorry. Another contribution he's made is the concept of anti-narcissism. He, he said that the anti-narcissist is a self-limiting kind of narcissist. It's a narcissist who refuses to become, he refuses to grow up, refuses to mature, refuses to develop themselves or their talents, refuses in Maslow's, Abraham Maslow's word, phrase, refuses to self-actualize. And why is that? Because this kind of narcissist, the anti-narcissist, exaggerate their sense of self-importance in defeat. Defeat is their locus of grandiosity. In a minute I will deal with it in, when I describe my work. Bola said, this anti-elaborative person stews in his own juice and adamantly refuses to nurture himself. The anti-narcissist is a hostile sadistic uh, person or at least he has a hostile and sadistic core envious also behind the facade which is self-effacing compassionate caring empathic considerate and in this sense the anti-narcissist is a very close relative close kin of the covert narcissist so this is christopher bolas of the um uh, of the unthought known thing and or his contribution to anti-narcissism. There were others who have dealt with anti-narcissism. Fritz Wittles described anti-narcissism as a tendency of two lovers to lose themselves in each other. So he regarded love as a form of anti-narcissism. He said the essence of love is, the identif is identification with each other. So we become conscious only through the other. 
I strongly disagree with Whittles. I think he's not describing not love. He's describing symbiosis or dependency. And this is a common mistake in psychological literature to mislabel many psychological dynamics and processes as love when they're actually the exact opposite of love. So that leads to my work. In my work, the anti-narcissist is a masochistic covert narcissist. The grandiosity of, the, of this kind of of this kind of narcissist. Because in my work, the anti-narcissist is a narcissist. Only it's a covert narcissist who is masochistic, self-rejecting, self-hating, self-loathing, self-destructive and self-defeating, self-harming and self-trashing. So this kind of narcissist who is covert and at the same time self-hating and masochistic, put them together and we get the anti-narcissist in my work. This kind of, of patient, this kind of person, is grandiose. But his or her grandiosity is founded on failure, on defeat, on self-annihilation and self-destruction. Because this kind of person seeks to merge with his empty schizoid core. He seeks to go back to the womb. It's like a process of unbecoming, slow death, inexorable. A death that is actually a rebirth. It's a very complex process described amply by Guntrip and, and, and others. So the grandiose narcissist someone some, sometimes uh, switches to the anti-narcissistic masochistic covert state. There's no type constancy. So what is the dynamic of this kind of anti-narcissist? He is angered by the lack of narcissistic supply and he directs some of this negative effect, some of this fury inwards, punishing himself for his failure. And this masochistic behavior has the added benefit of forcing the narcissist's nearest, dearest and closest to assume the roles of dismayed spectators or of persecutors. And so either way, he garners attention. His masochism is a way to attract attention. And he, he basks and he glories or self-glories in his failures and defeats. His grandiosity consists of, the, of saying no one has failed as deeply and as pervasively and as much as I have. My defeat is the largest ever. My bankruptcy is the biggest in, in history. It's like I'm unique even in failure and defeat, and this attracts the attention of people around him. Self-administered punishment often manifested as a self-handicapping masochism, kind of narcissistic cop-out. By undermining his work, his relationships, his efforts, his projects, this kind of, of fragile narcissist avoids criticism and censure negative supply is when you never complete anything when you never succeed when you never accomplish anything when you are your worst enemy when you undermine yourself criticize yourself hate yourself reject yourself external rejection has no power external criticism has been preempted it's all meaningless only you matter self-inflicted failure is a kind of vaccine or an immunological reaction. It's, this is the narcissist doing, the anti-narcissist doing, choosing to fail and defeat oneself, trip up oneself, set oneself up for failure, means that you are in control of your life, the master of your own fate. You decide to fail, so you're in charge. You defeat yourself, so you're the boss. You are calling the shots. You're in the driver's seat. Masochistic narcissists keep finding themselves in, in self-defeating circumstances, which render success impossible. Because as Millen said, uh, they're trying to avoid an objective assessment of their performance. These people, the anti-narcissists, they act carelessly. They withdraw in mid-effort. They are constantly fatigued or bored or disaffected 
they passive aggressively sabotage their own lives. Their suffering is ostentatious and defiant. It's like performative suffering. And, they, and by deciding to abort, they reassert the control, mastery, and therefore godlike omnipotence over their own fate. I am the master of my fate, not even God. The narcissist pronounced, the anti narcissist pronounced in public misery and self pity are compensatory. Again, to refer to Milan, he said, they reinforce his self esteem against overwhelming convictions of worthlessness. The anti narcissist tribulations and anguish render the, uh, render the anti narcissist in his own eyes unique saintly, immaculate, angelic, virtuous, righteous, resilient, significant. And so anti-narcissists uh, use suffering and defeat and failure and self-handicapping, self-hindering. They use all this. The enhancing of difficulties in their lives and miseries, they use this as self-generated narcissistic supply, a form of self-supply. And so the worse the anguish and the unhappiness, the more relieved and elated the anti-narcissist feels. Like some of you, I assume. 